While SMT and Pokemon are clearly different games, trying to do different things and appeal to different audiences, I think it's pretty reasonable to draw comparisons. They're both part of the RPG where you make friends out of hostile NPCs subgenre, with one being more or less the grandfather of the genre and the other being the indisputed most popular. But, more importantly, growing up with Pokemon, like everyone else, it's been my only real baseline for a series like SMT. And now going deeper into the Tensei series past just Persona, I keep finding things that SMT did and continues to do that I always used to wish Pokemon would attempt. SMT is a billion spin-offs that experiment with the mainline formula. What if the game wasn't set in a post-apocalypse? What if you didn't recruit demons at all? What if the combat was in real time? What if you had to manage limited time and strike a balance between dungeon crawling and life as a high schooler? Meanwhile, Pokemon asks, do you have any slurs you'd like to tell Pikachu? There are a lot of Pokemon spin-offs, but they're rarely alternative takes on the mainline Pokemon RPG formula. They usually like racing games or puzzle games, borderline experimental shovelware, or a pay-to-win MOBA. You don't really get a whole lot of games where you acquire and battle Pokemon outside of the extremely stale main series. The series has gotten some spin-offs in the past, but Conquest and the long-running Mystery Dungeon side series are both crossovers where an already existing IP got a Pokemon facelift. Colosseum and its sequel, on the other hand, are more or less the exact kind of spin-offs that play with the main formula that I'm talking about. Too bad they only made two. People must have taken one look at Gale of Darkness, exited, and walked away. We are only just now getting Pokemon Legends, the first proper RPG sub-series made by Game Freak, the mainline devs, where they actually play around with the formula. Meanwhile, Megami Tensei has been constantly stretching and playing with its formula, taking the base game or making it in as many ways as it possibly can. You're spoiled for choices. The spin-offs have spin-offs. I can't even read this list without my eyes defocusing. They even make the stupid shovelware games if you're into that. There's no Hey You Jack Frost, though. Probably because he would yell his slurs back. Anyway, after Nocturne, I thought it'd be nice if I tried another Tensei spin-off that wasn't Persona to get some more perspective on the series. We've got a very limited amount of This Is Like Personas that you can perform without anamorphing into an IGN writer. It didn't take very long for me to see the turn-based tactics, one where you move on a grid. I suffer from the condition known as liking XCOM, so I decided to give it a try. Devil Survivor is a tactics RPG that's split between combat encounters where you control up to four squads at once, and a choose-your-own-adventure VN with some time management and route selection elements. Overall, I thought the game was fairly good. The time management stuff wasn't exactly what I was hoping it would be. The lack of exploration made the game world feel a little bit shallow, but the game's combat and roster building made up for it. Similar to mainline SMT, you're given a pretty big toolbox to make your teams with, but there's a lot of new moving parts that play into the squad system and other new mechanics introduced in Devil Survivor. You're also presented with some really tough fights that require you to have a fairly good understanding of the game's mechanics to clear. It should be said and stressed that this is not a good entry point for the series. It's brutal. If you don't already know how SMT combat and demon fusion works, you're gonna get destroyed. Like all the other Mega 10 games I've played so far, Double Survivor has you playing as a high schooler. After a brief opening scene that cuts between some vague hints at the instigating events of the plot and some ominous epic speak text, you're introduced to your player character and two classmates. Atsuro, whose name I read as Astro up until just now, and who's a dorky hacker. I wanna push the power button on his hat. And then there's Yuzu. Her character is that she's scared and wants to go home, and she texts like she owns a gur hoodie. The plot starts with you and your friends being called together by your reptilian cousin. He doesn't show up to the actual playdate, but he does hand use you three Nintendo DS's before slithering under a rock prior to you three meeting. Upon inspection, Atsuru informs you that the DS's are cracked and running a homebrew operating system. Throughout the day, you learn that it's able to tell the future, correctly predicting someone getting mauled in their apartment 30 minutes before it happens. That's not all. Its primary function is to download and summon demons from the Devil's Plex server, allowing you to bid on demons auctioning themselves off and fuse them together to make stronger demons. Sort of in the middle of drip-feeding how the DS's work, the game introduces you to the Shoman Kai cult. They're like a doomsday cult, and their whole pitch is that in Genesis, God directly intervened when the people of the world united came together to construct the Tower of Babel in an attempt to reach heaven. God stopped this by causing everyone to begin speaking different languages and scatter across the world. <laughs> The cult believes that the internet checks enough of the same boxes of the construction of a tower, connecting all the world's people and allowing them to freely communicate. You're told that because of this interconnectivity, as well as mankind's arrogance, God will once again cast judgment on us. The game goes more into the relevance of the internet later. The details of what it says are a little spoilery, but like, barely. But I also saw it coming and I want to talk about it. I'll be vague. But in a hypothetical situation where you have beings born and fed by energy, generated from human emotion, base impulses, and obsessions, the internet would be a central breeding ground for them. The internet is more or less the raw material that makes demons in settings like SMT. It's called Magnetite Megaten, and in Warhammer, which has very similar demons, they call it the Winds of Magic. Why do you think they called an installation wizard?
Anyway, the prologue wraps up with two more of the DS's predictions of the future coming true, with an explosion of unknown origin igniting in the distance, followed by a total blackout of the whole Tokyo area. All of this happening while it becomes evident that there's demons running around on the loose terrorizing people. The three protagonists, stranded from their homes, sleep in a cemetery and wake up to find they're trapped in a military lockdown spanning over a large part of Tokyo. What's even worse is that their DS's have a new batch of predictions, one being that they're going to be killed by a snowman in a few hours. Happy birthday! From that point on, the story breaks into a series of simultaneous subplots involving a cast of characters who are all stuck in the lockdown with you. There's an indie rock singer and her bodyguard, an elementary school nurse, a middle school buddy of Atsuro's, a cosplayer with an orc tooth, two spec ops members, a wagey, a gang leader, a journalist, a couple of named cult members, and your snake-faced cousin. Everyone's always running around doing their own thing throughout the game, often crossing paths with one another. How you decide to spend your limited time determines what you'll witness and learn, and also what events do and don't happen as you intervene in side stories where they play out while you're not around. Subplots including, why is the military keeping us here? Where are the demons coming from? What's the cult steal? Are vampires real? And is one in here with us right now? Are you a vampire? What's your cousin doing? Why is his face like that? Why is my cell phone getting warmer? It's a pretty unique story, and it's delivered in a pretty unique way. The inclusion of the lockdown as a central plot point has led some people to draw comparisons to recent real-life occurrences, but I think that's a stretch. Like, elephant in the room, where's the demons? Those clown manifestations happened way back in 2016. That's old news, and those were Nephilim. That's only half-demon. Something like the launch of Warhammer 3 doesn't count either, despite its demonic theming. It's just a single video game release, and it's only now coming out. While the relevant world events have been going on for years now, the plot of Double Survivor involves a demonic invasion. Was there anything in the time between the second half of 2019 and now that seems all that demonic to you? Was there anything during that time that everyone was stuck inside that presented itself as a spirit or deity that fed on the mass human emotion and obsession found on the internet? Maybe trying to influence people into establishing and joining cults to them. Like the one in the game where they have their own symbol, that lotus flower star thing. That may seem like a weird detail, but icons are universal things in cults and faiths. Try to find me a religion, fictitious or real, that doesn't have one. I think that makes a pretty good list of requirements to meet and it filters out some of the dumb stuff, like the Clowns of 16 and Warhammer 3. If you want to say Devil Survivor, ever predicted the future, where's the demons? Frankly, I can't think of anything. A video about Pikmin, don't mind if I do! Like I said previously, the gameplay is split between a time management VN thing and tactical battles. Instead of exploring real-time environments, the time between talking or fighting is spent on a menu that gives you a list of locations to check out. Exclamation marks mean you'll have to fight a battle, and locations that have a little clock icon have something going on in them that you can investigate at the cost of 30 in-game minutes. Any involved characters, portraits will appear over the area, and the option to investigate will usually be their names. Most time-consuming events are generally short, comparable to the length of a social link scene in Persona a game. You'll be seeing a lot of them, though. You pretty regularly get dialogue options, but they rarely matter. It's usually two different ways to say the same thing, which will get the same response from whoever you're talking to. There are times when your dialogue choices matter, though, so you should generally pay attention to what's being said and asked, but usually the more consequential decision is determining what events to show up for. Being there and not being there matters more than what you say while you're there. The game takes place over the course of about a week. Days are informally split up between mandatory battles. Each section of the day will have a selection of the available characters doing something or other, and at least one available fight to complete. It's up to you who you'll check in on, and after you meet up with enough people and spend enough time, whatever events you didn't prioritize will resolve without you, and you'll be left with only a mandatory battle blocking further progress. You go through this cycle a few times each day before passing out and waking up the next day. Each night you'll get emails from the other NPCs running around, and each morning you'll get a newsletter telling you about all the worst events that will be happening throughout the day. Most characters have a key event or two throughout the week where if you ignore them, they'll be killed. You'll usually know when someone's about to bite it, though. For one, your magical DS's let you see the estimated time someone has to live in days, and two, your morning newsletter usually fills in the blanks by giving you the exact hour and a hint describing what will happen to them. Right before the endgame begins, based off who you spent time with and who survived, you'll be given a list of NPCs to choose from. Whoever you pick here will determine your ending and change up how some of the final events play out before the ending unfolds. 
Overall, I thought the VN side of the game was pretty good, and the narrative structure of having a bunch of stuff happening at once while forcing the player to pick and choose what to witness felt very compelling and unique to interact with. I've only really got two main complaints with the VN stuff. Like I mentioned earlier, you don't get to explore at all. The whole game is either menus or turn-based combat encounters, which doesn't really feel like enough to get across the scale of the game's setting and events. Second, while the game does telegraph when characters are going to need to be saved, it's very vague about what's going to actually happen in any of the other given events. And also, it's vague about how long the events will still be available. Some events are slice of life filler or vague foreshadowing, while others are major turning points in a character's arc. Good lord, what is happening in there? Since you're given so little information, it's hard to tell what you'll be dedicating your limited time to, and what you'll be missing. One of the early encounters with the journalist has her telling you that people tend to act irrationally when they're forced to make uninformed decisions. And I assume that was meant to be a little meta hint that the game was trying to make you panic a little bit. That's all well and good, I don't mind having to make uninformed decisions and just see how things play out every once in a while. But the way the game's set up, instead of walking to make progress, you're trapped in a menu, and to move things forward, you're spending a limited resource without knowing what you're spending it on while the game laughs at you. I found it to be kind of Exhausting. It's like every waking moment you have Dilbert in your face asking Ranch or Cool Ranch. And frankly, it kind of stressed me out. Outside of the VN stuff, you got your squad building and combat. Instead of random encounters, fighting in Devil Survivor is done in combat missions, split between grid-based squad navigation and a combat screen that reminds me of one of those unfitting music put over an unnerving image videos. Both layers are turn-based, but handle their turns differently. The navigation layer operates off a recovery system. The gist of the system is that while a squad is able to perform a bunch of actions every turn, like buffs, heals, movement, and attacking, the more stuff you do, the longer it'll take before you're granted another turn. Once a squad performs an attack command on an enemy, you enter the combat screen. It functions a little bit like a diet mainline battle, complete with a diet press turn system. Each instance of combat has two phases, the initial turn and the extra turn. Everyone gets to attack during the initial phase, usually. The extra turn, on the other hand, has to be earned. Access to the extra turn is earned through similar means to how you'd extend your turn in mainline. Critical hits, exploiting enemy weaknesses, or being hit with an attack you resist grant you an extra turn, usually. It's either RNG based or determined by a hidden granular meter. Also unlike mainline, you can also smack the extra turn out of enemies by critting them or exploiting weakness. Squads are made up of three members, a middle leader and two supporting wingmen. While the wingmen are alive, the leader takes reduced damage, but if the leader is eliminated, the squad gets disbanded instantly. This arrangement sort of mirrors how losing your MC results in a game over in most other mainline titles. Except you get to be the one handing out the BS for once. Speaking of which, if your main character squad gets wiped, you're still not handed a game over right away in Devil Survivor. The catch is that each battle has a list of failure conditions, one usually being protect civilians. If just one bystander in a bystander squad gets eliminated, you're loading a save. This is fairly annoying already, but it gets worse. As the mission progresses, it's not uncommon for the objective to totally change without warning. For instance, the initial objective may send you to one side of the map to clear a squad, but right as you're done with that, someone in danger will manifest on the other side, and if you're not already there prepared for it, you lose. Whenever a goal shift like this happens, the conditions list comes back up and it changes right in front of you. This can and does happen multiple times in the same fights and it starts feeling a bit comical after the third or fourth time. As annoying as this can feel, it's not all that unfamiliar of a mechanic to SMT. The shifting objectives make you approach your first run of a mission similarly to how you'd approach your first run against a boss in Mainliner Persona. Your main goal is to try to get as far as you can through the encounter to see how all the different phases work, before getting blown in half and then having to try again, but this time with a squad you've built special just to tackle this fight. Speaking of which, team composition and your tools for building your teams are a little remix in Double Survivor. You control up to four squads at once, each acting like a small mainline party with a human leader and two demons. Like I've alluded to previously, demons in SMT aren't all red imp guys from hell. They're like manifestations of belief in legends. You've got a selection of various religious figures, mythological creatures, and other weird stuff. A pretty good example of how weird the inclusions can get is the uh, Pendragon. It's not actually based off a mythological dragon that was said to exist or anything. Pendragon is a title that King Arthur's dad gave himself after winning a battle where two comets flew across the battlefield. So not even a monster from the story, but a representation of a title and symbol. It's kind of like if the eagle on a dollar bill was a demon. Coincidentally, the story of the battle with the comets being what inspires the dragon Dragon title is probably also the inspiration for the Twin Tail Comet Warhammer. So the Pendragon and Twin Tail Comet are kind of similar figures from the same base material. This is a funny connection to stumble on when I already mentioned Warhammer twice. Anyway, demon recruitment no longer involves verbal negotiations. Instead, you buy or bid on demons using an auction site. It's functionally similar to a raw negotiation. You throw money at a demon until they become your friend. Except now you don't have to pay out unless you're guaranteed to be getting a party member. Demons won't bail on you anymore, but they will still try to take you for a ride sometimes. After winning an auction, there's a chance the amount you owe will change or the demon might have just been catfishing you and they were never who they claimed to be. 
As the plot progresses, more demon types will become available, and whenever time passes or you restart the game, the auction site will refresh, giving you a new selection. It's a good idea to check through what's available, even stuff you might not think you want. If they're rated 5 stars, there's a chance they might have an extra skill you do want. Overall, it's a pretty fun system. Unlike negotiations, there's no auction-specific skills or anything, though, making it feel a little bit shallow in comparison. Roster progression functions similar to other SMT games with a few twists. For humans, the biggest change is you have a big list of skills you can freely equip to your squad leaders at any time between battles. You fill this list out through cracking skills by first choosing an unlearned skill an enemy has, assigning a squad leader to that enemy, and then defeating that enemy with that squad leader's party. Humans will level up at a fairly reasonable rate, while demons tend to require way more XP to advance. As demon members fall behind and become obsolete, you're meant to combine them to create stronger party members through the fusion system. Figuring out fusion is still a fairly complex task, but it's pared down a bit in Devil Survivor, likely to offset how many more demons you'll have to manage at once. Instead of having eight generic slots, demons have three slots for attacks, three for passives and one tribal skill based off their family. There's also far less learned skills per character. Fusing two demons together generally results in a demon of a higher level, letting you maintain a party close to your main character's level without grinding the ludicrous amount of XP demons require. The catches are that you can't create a demon that's a higher level than your main character, and while a resulting demon can inherit skills from the fused demons, a lot of the time the resulting character can't make great use of them. Getting the skills you want where you want them can be a bit of a puzzle, but figuring it out is essential if you want to complete these games. I was fairly reliant on sacrificial fusion to transfer relevant skills throughout my Nocturne playthrough, but with that gone in Devil Survivor, I was kinda lost for a while. Luckily, the game occasionally lets you give a demon an attack from your list of crack skills mid-battle, which does help a lot, but passives must be gained through fusion. I eventually did stumble onto the other way to parry skills over that was introduced in Nocturne and carried into DS. Let's say you have a demon with a skill and another existing demon that you want that skill to be on. Fuse the skill haver demon with a demon of the same family. This will create an elemental, and also cost a thousand dollars. Make sure to transfer that skill onto the elemental. Then make a different elemental and fuse the two elementals together into one of those goofy teardrops with a face. Again, make sure to transfer the skill you went over to the teardrop, and then pay three grand. Finally, fuse that teardrop and the demon who you want to put the skill on, and the resulting character should just be the skill needing demon, but you're given a chance to move the skill onto him. It's costly and time consuming, but it works. Your usual goal with fusion is to make winning teams, obviously. But what that looks like in Devil Survivor is a little bit different from Mainline. In Mainline, you're trying to create a few OP demons to carry fights or counter a specific boss. This means building a team that's good at shutting down enemies' turns as well as extending your own while weaving in buffs and heals when you get the chance. In Devil Survivor, the general goal is to construct your squads in a way that both synergize with the leaders you have while also being built to counter enemy squads, effectively enough to be able to cut them down in as few turns as possible. As an example, Yuzu is slow, so pairing her with a demon that could boost her speed speed or extend her attack range is kind of required. After you have that baseline, you have to give her and her team damage types and resistances that let her specialize against some of the stuff you're currently running into. Let's say three archetypes of squads are spawning. A, B, and C. You can't be good against everything, so you specialize Yuzu's team against A and a little bit against B. And then set your other two squads up similarly, but specialize them against different squads than the ones Yuzu wants to target. Once you've got that all set up, battles become kind of a mix of checkers and rock, paper, scissors, where you try to position to take good matchups while trying to avoid bad matchups. If that sounds simple, that's because I'm simplifying. In game, you're not dealing with A, B, C labels, you're dealing with. <laughs> Mainline SMT are considered to be fairly difficult games, and in those you're just dealing with isolated encounters. In Devil Survivor you're dealing with a bunch of encounters running around at once. Just by merit of having more variables, you can kind of see why the game gets its reputation of being very difficult. So in closing, I thought it was a pretty good game that played around with some fun ideas and demonstrated the kind of interesting things you can get out of proper spinoffs. If I were to rate the current SMT games I've played so far by difficulty, it's just been like a straight climb up. DS at the top, followed by Nocturne, and then the three Persona games I've played so far. Rating my quality is a different story, though. I solve this objectively. First, remove the soulless titles, then equate the three remaining titles to the Pikmin types of the Sith share the same color. From here, it's easy. The yellow's ears alter the base so it too much, and it looks like PP so it's last. Red are in the good category since they do more damage, and the nose looks like a hummingbird since Big Mentry Connector makes sense and works. Blue are also good because they have gills which makes them strong against the most despicable hazard of all. Water.